day and welcome to Faith to Face. Today we're looking at the Byzantine Church, basically the Eastern Orthodox Churches. The importance of the Eastern Orthodox Church is often overlooked in Western tradition because our, the focus of our attention has tended to be directed primarily towards the Church of Western Europe from whence our own traditions have developed. So how did Eastern Orthodoxy develop? Well, first we must remember from our lecture of last week on the Western European Church, the growth of Catholicism and much of the outside influence on the Church came from its association with the Roman Empire. Also, we must note that in the area of secular history, the old Roman Empire was crumbling and virtually dead. The new capital of the Roman Empire came to be centred in Constantinople or Byzantine, though this was not always accepted by Rome itself. Effectively, with the invasion of the barbarian hordes into Western Europe and the sack of Rome, the Eastern Empire came to develop its own identity apart from Rome. The concept of orthodoxy arose out of the separate identity in the sense that the Eastern Church saw heretical developments in Rome and vice versa, and maintained that it alone had continued the true apostolic tradition, while Catholicism had become indoctrinated by the influence of the state. So let's look at theology and tradition in the Orthodox churches. First, we're going to look at the Patristic Fathers. A characteristic feature of the Greek church, and of the Orthodox church generally, is the view that Orthodox doctrine is changeless, and that Christian truth is immutable. The church therefore placed great store by the teaching of the fathers who were seen to represent the line of consistency and continuity. This patristic approach holds that there is a line of consistent orthodox doctrine flowing from those theologians whom the church elevated to patristic status. And such elevation was based on their consistent witness to the changelessness of the truth contained in the scriptures within the ongoing process of contextualizing the gospel in different ages, places, and situations. Put more simply, Orthodox doctrine holds that the gospel is unchanging, but the world is in a continuous state of change. In order to consistently apply then the truth of Scripture to this changing world, the Orthodox Church holds that certain fathers are to be recognized as interpreters of Scripture for the time. So in a sense, this is true for any Christian. How do we, for example, uh, interpret the Scriptures with regard to the Christian responses to events in the Middle East or even in the United States? We are dependent either on our own interpretation or on that of someone else, perhaps more learned, perhaps not in this digital age that we're in. And in each case, uh, we hope that they are somehow guided by the Spirit. The Orthodox Church holds that such interpretations are too open to heresy and man-made doctrine. To overcome this, only those who have already revealed a consistent and true interpretation of Scripture are recognized as patristic authority. The apostles were regarded as the foundation and the original witness to the truth, and their words in Scripture are accepted as normative and absolute. The Orthodox Church further holds that the authority of Scripture must be the authority of Scripture properly interpreted, and this proper interpretation came to be seen as interpretation in the patristic tradition. If any dispute arose over the teaching of a father, or if there appeared to be any error or contradiction in his writing, attempts were made to harmonize his words with the patristic mind and with the consensus of the fathers, the so-called consensus patrum. The consensus patrum is peculiar to the Eastern Church and it was regarded by them as deriving primarily from the teaching of the councils. So the fathers handed down the tradition based on their interpretation of the scripture, but it was the councils who were the main channel 
of the tradition. And in this way, the Eastern Orthodox Church sought to keep the purity of the scriptural tradition in the face of conflicting and erroneous interpretations arising from both within and without the church. There's also a peculiarity of the Orthodox churches is this link between worship and theology. Worship and theology were extremely closely linked in Eastern Christian tradition. And that explains the very serious and yet very popular involvement in doctrinal issues by the man in the street. Whether Jesus was the eternal son of God or not was not just a matter of philosophical speculation, but it had to do with worship. So at the heart of the Arian heresy, you remember that from a few sessions back, was the thought that by making Jesus less than God, Christians were then worshipping a creature. The substantiation of divinity in the Holy Spirit was to be found in the scriptures and in the liturgy, especially in the doxologies and the baptismal rite. Many heresies concerning the Holy Spirit were so declared because they were in contradiction with the church's experience in worship. Interestingly, this is similar to the view that is taken today by many who oppose the charismatic experience of worship. So here's a summary of Byzantine theology. The Byzantine approach to theology can best be described by the word paradosis, which means tradition, or more literally, that which is handed down. The tradition was received in the form of the scriptures, the fathers, the councils, and the liturgy. The Eastern Christian saw himself as the inheritor of a rich tradition, which it was his duty to preserve and to pass on unimpaired to future generations. The fact that the Byzantine Empire encompassed all of the places mentioned in the New Testament scriptures, except Rome itself, gave added impetus to their claim of being the true inheritors of the early apostolic church. In fact, most of our scripture sources were preserved for us by the Byzantine church. And then because the Byzantine Empire did not have a Middle Ages like they did in Europe, nor a scholastic period in which philosophical traditions influenced Christian thinking, the Eastern Orthodox Church has retained a strong sense of continuity with early patristic traditions. And one of these was the tradition of the Cappadocian Fathers. In the 4th century, Eastern Orthodoxy became firmly established in the teaching of the so-called Cappadocian Fathers, Basil the Great, Gregory of Nazianzus, and Gregory of Nyssa, Basil's brother. They were active in the period between the First and the Second Ecumenical Councils and were the major contributors to our current understanding of the Trinity. They sought primarily to reconcile the more moderate Arians to the Nicene doctrine of the divinity of Christ by making a very important distinction between the one essence, the Usia, and the three persons, the hypostasis of God in Christ. They thus sought to show that God was not one person with three faces, nor one God who had successively revealed himself in three different modes. And in making this distinction, the Cappadocian fathers had borrowed from Oregon, <laughs> who was declared an heretic, and from the Greek Platonic thinking and from the Aristotelian traditions. But this was not a speculative or scholastic work, but very much a pastoral insight, trying to find the right words and right meaning of words to make the Christian faith better understood. And there was a very deep concern, and still is, a deep concern for correct Christology in orthodox thinking. So while the Latin West was content with the Chalcedonian definition of 451 AD, which declared Christ to be one person with two natures, one divine and one human, and from there went on to explore other different aspects of the Christian faith, such as one, the relationship between nature and grace. Two, the meaning of the sacraments. Three, the relationship between the civil and ecclesiastical authorities and so on. The Greek East 
continued to be troubled by the Christological question, who is Jesus, God or man? How can it be both God and man? And if he is, how can that be? Does it in any way dilute his divinity? With a liturgical approach to worship emphasizing the divinity of Jesus and a popular involvement by the man in the street in things theological, it's not surprising that this was such an important and controversial issue. The whole question of Eastern Christology arose from the differing views of the Coptic Church, the Ethiopian Church, large numbers of Syrian Christians, and the ancient Armenian Church via the Imperial Church of Constantinople. By and large, the Imperial Church, that's the successor to, to the Roman Church, was concerned to bring these other groups back into orthodoxy with their view on the twofold nature of Christ. The problem concerned the hypostases, the person or who of Christ, and the physis, the nature or the what of Christ. The Coptics and the others held that Christ had only one nature, and that nature was divine. To accept the human nature, they said, was tantamount to saying that Jesus was a creature, i.e. a creation like us, although higher than us, and they considered this to be a heresy. After Chalcedon, the, the big meeting that took place there, four main Christological parties existed in the East. There were, and this is interesting, uh, and all of these different words that come with it, there were the Monophysites who followed the views of Cyril of Alexandria, one person, one nature, and who also held to the Theopascite formula that one of the Holy Trinity had suffered in the flesh. Second, there was the strict Diophysites who held firmly to the Chalcedonian view that Christ is one person with two natures, one human, one divine. These natures are not divided and not confused and are wholly complete in Christ. And they rejected the Theopascite formula. The, and then thirdly, there were the Oregonists who were rejected as heretics for their view that Jesus is not the Logos, but is the sinless intellect who has been united with the Logos. And then fourth, the Caesarelian Chalcedonists who held to the Chalcedonian doctrine concerning the twofold nature of Christ, but who also accepted the Theopascite formula of Cyril, that one of the Holy Trinity had suffered in the flesh. Wow, isn't that confusing? You can see all of these things going on in people's minds and talking in the street and over coffee at the, uh, in the cafes. At the Fifth Council, Constantinople II, that was in 553, Cyrillian Chalcedonian triumphed. In the main, it was understood that the point of one nature taken by Cyril meant the same as one person taken by Chalcedon. Although the council was conciliatory, it did not achieve the objective of bringing the separated brethren back into the fold. Wow, this is, this is just so much stuff. But let's just stop a moment and think about icons in the Orthodox Church. Because icons or images are significant to the Orthodox Church. And this also has to do with their Christology. You see, debate around their use centers on the second commandment. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. At its heart, this whole idea um, of icons, uh, it was much more than a Christological debate, than a concern about decorations or idols. You see, the question arose for them was, how is it possible to represent someone, create an image of someone who is both God and man? Either one was merely painting Christ's humanity and thus separating him from his divinity, or one was representing both and thus confusing the, the very nature of Christ or the two natures of Christ. In the end, those who in favor of the icons won the, the, the day on the basis that the incarnation of the Logos of God 
in Christ Jesus, they said, God had become man and he was thus able to be described in both words and in images. It was possible to describe the person of the Son of God by means of his human nature. And the matter was resolved at the seventh ecumenical council held in Nicaea in 787 AD. The Holy Fathers articulated the view that there was a difference between worship reserved for God and the veneration of icons. The council also declared that the honor given to the image passes on to that which the image represents. Through icons, Orthodox Christians find themselves drawn closer to Christ. Before we close the session, we should also take a quick look at the so-called filioque debate. Translation, translated filioque means and the son. And this relates to the addition of those words in the Nicene Creed regarding the Holy Spirit. The Nicaea Council in 325 AD had determined that the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, proceeded from the Father and is to be worshipped and glorified with the Father and the Son. However, in 589 AD, King Recorid of Spain declared that the Holy Spirit should be confessed as proceeding from the Father and the Son. He meant well, but the Orthodox Church took exception to this, declaring that that contradicted Scripture, noting that John 15, 26 was clear that the Spirit proceeds from the Father alone. You see, everything revolved around the way in which they interpreted Scripture. Scripture was the essence, then there was the Father's, then there were the councils, and then there was worship, the way in which they understood. And the whole thing was to elevate the look of Christ. Well, I trust that you have found this interesting, certainly a different perspective for those of us who have grown up with a predominantly Western theology, with its focus on church and state. I particularly have found the focus on holding to ancient traditions and the elevation of Christ to be quite refreshing. I'm reminded of the words in Jeremiah 6.16, Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. Let me tell you, I've purchased for myself uh, the Orthodox Study Bible for further study and meditation. You might think about this. I got this uh, at Kurong. Um, I found it fascinating to, to read and to, to meditate upon. And now here's something to think about. First, talk about what you know about the Orthodox Church. Second, Eastern Christians, even the man in the street, give much thought to the nature of Christ, particularly how his humanity and divinity fit together. Discuss that in your group. God bless you, and I'll see you next time.